Good afternoon. I'm Dean Jessica Berg, and I'm going to welcome you today to our Canary Lecture. The annual Sumner Canary Lecture is one of our premier endowed lectures, which brings extraordinary jurists to the school to discuss current legal issues. It was established to honor the memory of the late Judge Sumner Canary, who was on the Ohio Court of Appeals for the 8th District and formerly a U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of Ohio. The lecture series is made possible through the incredible generosity of his widow, Nancy Canary. While Nancy could not be here this evening, her sister, Marty, is here. Um, and so I just want to say thank you generally uh, to the Canary family for letting us do this. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Professor Jonathan Adler, who will introduce our distinguished speaker. Thank you. It's a, a pleasure to have the honor and privilege to introduce uh, this year's uh, Canary Lecturer, uh, Judge Neil Gorsuch of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit. Uh, Judge Gorsuch has been on the Tenth Circuit since 2006. Uh, prior to that, he was the principal deputy, uh, principal deputy associate attorney general in the U.S. Department of Justice. Uh, practiced at the firm of Kellogg, Kellogg Huber. Uh, clerked for Judge David Santel in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, as well as for Justices Byron White and Anthony Kennedy on the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, attended uh, Columbia University, Harvard Law School, and uh, was a Marshall Scholar uh, at uh, the University of Oxford as well. Uh, and today contain, continues his connection to academia, not only through things like lectures like this, but as a, a adjunct faculty member at the University of Colorado Law School, where he teaches, uh, I believe, professional responsibility, as well as antitrust, uh, which was one of the issues that he practiced. Um, he lives uh, with his wife and two daughters in, in Colorado. We're certainly very uh, pleased and honored that he would make the trip to join us today. And given um, the state of things when it comes to judicial nominations today, I can't help but note uh, that when he was nominated to uh, the U.S. Court of Appeals, uh, he was confirmed unanimously by a voice vote. Um, which is something. Uh, I think it says something both about uh, what things were like then as opposed to now, uh, but also something about the high esteem that those who know Judge Gorsuch have uh, for his intellect, his thoughtfulness, and we're certainly pleased and honored that he was willing to share some of his time with us today. You didn't come here to listen to me, so without any further ado, I will turn it over uh, to Judge Gorsuch. Well, it's, it's lovely to be here, but if you were looking for a talk tonight about the maddening maze of our civil justice system, its exuberant procedures that price so many people out of court and force those inside of it to wade wearily through years and fortunes to judgment, you came to the right place, almost. When Jonathan uh, kindly asked me to share a few words with you tonight, that was my intended topic. I had just finished writing two opinions, one of which was uh, a case that was older than my law clerks and had outlived most of the plaintiffs in the class. The other had bounced up and down the federal court system for so long, it was almost as old as Cleveland's championship drought. <laughs> you, you know you're in, sorry. I, I, I'm skipping the Elway jokes tonight, I promise. You know you're in trouble when the Roman numeral you used to distinguish your opinion from all the others that of the same name draws closer to starting with an X than an I. Needless to say, I was and remain eager to talk about the need for civil justice reform. But that was then and this is now. Since Jonathan extended his invitation, the world suffered a seismic shock with the loss of Justice Scalia. A few weeks ago, I was taking a breather in the middle of a ski run with little on my mind but the next mogul field before me when the phone rang with the news. I immediately lost what breath I had left, and I'm not admit, embarrassed to admit that I couldn't see the rest of the way down the mountain for the tears. From that moment, it seemed to me clear that there was no way I could give a speech at this moment about the law without reference to that news. So tonight, I would like to say a few words about Justice Scalia's legacy. Sometimes people are described as lions of their profession, and I sometimes have difficulty understanding what that means, but not with Justice Scalia. He really was a lion of the law, docile in private life, 
but a ferocious fighter when at work, with a roar that could echo for miles. Volumes will be rightly written about his contributions to the law, both on and off the bench. I have a hard time thinking about another justice who's written so many articles and books about the law, even while serving on the court. Writings like a matter of interpretation or reading law that were sure to influence generations of students and lawyers to come. But tonight I wanna to touch on a more thematic point and suggest that perhaps the great project of the justice's career was to remind us of the differences between judges and legislators to remind us that legislators may appeal to their own moral convictions and to claims about social utility to reshape the law as they think it should be in the future. But the judges should do none of those things in a democratic society. The judges should instead strive, if humanly and so imperfectly, to apply the law as they find it, focusing backwards, not forwards, and looking to text, structure, and history, not their moral convictions or policy consequences they think best for society. As Justice Scalia put it, and it rings true to me, if you're gonna be a good and faithful judge, you have to resign yourself to the fact that you're not always going to like the conclusions you reach. If you like them all the time, you're probably doing something wrong. It seems to me there can be little doubt about the success of this great project. We live in an age when the job of the federal judge is not so much to expound common law as it is to interpret text, constitutional, statutory, regulatory, contractual. As Justice Kagan acknowledged in her Scalia lecture at Harvard Law School last year, we're all textualists now. Capturing the spirit of law school in the bad old days when she and I attended, Justice Kagan went on to relate how, back then, professors and students alike would often approach reading a statute with the question, gosh, what should the statute be? Rather than, what do the words of the statute say? That much has changed. And as Justice Kagan said, quote, Justice Scalia has had more to do with this change than anybody. He taught us, everyone, how to do statutory interpretation differently. I don't think there can be any better illustration of Justice Kagan's point than the very first opinion the Supreme Court issued after Justice Scalia's passing, Lockhart versus United States. That case involved the question, how best to interpret a statute imposing heightened penalties for three types of offenses? Aggravated sexual abuse, sexual abuse, and abusive sexual conduct involving a minor or ward. The majority opinion by Justice Sotomayor relied on the rule of the last antecedent and argued that the subordinate clause at the end of the sentence involving a minor or ward modified only the last offense listed so that the statute's penalties apply whenever there's an aggravated sexual abuse or sexual abuse or whenever there is an abuse of sexual conduct involving a minor award. In dissent, Justice Kagan argued that the rule of last antecedent sometimes gives way to ordinary understandings of how English works. And the language of this statute, she suggested, offered an example of the exception rather than the rule. In her estimation, most fairly read that subordinate clause involving a minor award modifies all three of the antecedents. So that the statutory penalties apply and the government must also always prove some kind of sexual abuse involving a minor award. In support of her reading, Justice Kagan offered this gem. Imagine a friend told you that she hoped to meet an actor, director, or producer with the new Star Wars movie. You would immediately know that she wanted to meet someone from the Star Wars cast, not from the latest Zoolander. As you can see, the two sides disagreed pretty avidly and colorfully but notice too that neither appealed to their views of optimal social policy. Their dispute focused on grammar, on language, on statutory structure. In fact, I have no doubt that several justices found themselves voting for an outcome they would have rejected as legislators. Now, one thing I know about Justice Scalia is that he loved a good fight. And it might be that he best of all loved a fight like this over the grammatical effect of a subordinate clause. It seems to me that if the Supreme Court were in the business of offering homages rather than judgments, it would be hard to imagine a more fitting one than this. Surely when the court handed down its opinions in Lockhart, the justice sat smiling from some happy place. But of course, every worthwhile endeavor attracts its critics. And Justice Scalia's great project is no exception. The critics come from different directions and with different agendas. 
Professor Ronald Dworkin, for example, once called the idea that judges should faithfully apply the law, uh, quote, empty statement, because many legal documents like the Constitution cannot be applied, quote, without making controversial judgments of political morality in light of the judge's own political principles. My admirable colleague, Judge Richard Posner, has also proven a skeptic of the project, of course. He said it's, quote, naive to think that judges actually believe their own opinions, for they often deny the legislative dimension of their work. And the truth is judges must and do and should consult their own moral convictions or consequentialist assessments about optimal social policy when resolving hard cases. Immediately after Justice Scalia's death, it seemed to me that so many more added their vo voices to this particular choir. Professor Lawrence Tribe wrote admiringly of the justice, but tempered it by seemingly chastising the justice for focusing too much on the means of making judicial decisions and not enough on the results, writing, quote, that interpretive methods don't determine, much less eclipse, outcomes. Others went further still, surmising that much of the justice's legacy would fade with his passing. Well, I'm afraid you'll have to mark me down as naive, as a believer that empty statements can have content, and adherent to the view that the outcomes, the ends, don't always or ever justify the means. Respectfully, it seems to me that an assiduous focus on text, structure, and history is essential to being a good judge that yes, judges should be in the business of declaring what the law is using the traditional tools of interpretation rather than pronouncing the law as they might wish it to be in light of their own views, always with an eye on the outcome, engaged perhaps in some Benthamite calculation of pleasures and pains along the way. Though the critics are loud and the temptations to join them may be many, mark me down too as a believer that this traditional account of the judicial role that Justice Scalia defended will endure and the predictions of its imminent demise are much exaggerated. Let me offer you three reasons for my faith on this score. First, consider the Constitution. Judges, after all, must do more than merely consider it along the way. We take an oath to uphold it. So any theory of judging in this country, seems to me, has to be measured against that foundational duty. Yet, those who would have judges behave like legislators, imposing their convictions and utility calculi on others, seem to me to face a pretty uphill battle when it comes to reconciling their judicial philosophy with that document. After all, at the Constitutional Convention, the framers explicitly debated a proposal, very much like the one the critics now suggest, one that would have incorporated the judiciary into a council of revision, a council with sweeping powers to review and veto congressional legislation. If you remember, but that proposal went down soundly to defeat, overwhelmed by a contrary view that judges should expound only upon the law as it comes before them, free from having participated in its creation. In place of a constitution that mixed legislative and judicial functions, the framers chose one that carefully separated them. The constitution devotes distinct articles to the legislative and the judicial power and creates separate institutions for each. Neither were these categories that they created empty ones to the founding generation, informed by a hard-earned intellectual inheritance, one perhaps equal parts English common law and enlightenment philosophy. The founders understood that the legislative power as the power to prescribe new rules of general applicability for the future, one properly guided by the will of the people acting through elected representatives, a task avowedly and sometimes even partisan in nature, and one unbound by the past, except to the extent, of course, that any law must conform to the Constitution, the highest law itself. Meanwhile, the founders understood that the judicial power is something that's backward looking, a way to resolve grievances when parties disagree over how existing law applies to them, a means not for making new law of general applicability for the future, but a way to resolve past disputes itself a necessary but quite distinct incident to civil society. One that's even further bound to the past by its respect for precedent and its use of analogies to past cases to resolve current disputes. To an adherent of the traditional view of judging, the task of, in any case then is to interpret the law as a reasonable and reasonably informed citizen might, all to protect settled expectations regarding the law's demands and to ensure that citizens are treated equally. As Blackstone explained, 
The job of a judge in a government of separated powers is emphatically not, quote, to make or new model the law. Or as Hamilton later echoed, it is for the judiciary to exercise, quote, neither force nor will, but merely judgment. Or again, as Marshall put it, it is for the judge to say what the law is. Other specific features of the Constitution confirm what I suggested structure indicates. Under Article I, of course, legislators are elected, serve for limited terms, and are answerable to their electors. Meanwhile, under Article III, judges are appointed for life and purposely unaccountable to the people. Legislators may pass laws of general applicability regarding what would otherwise be private conduct, but have to do so generally prospectively only. Judges, by contrast, are assigned the task of deciding discrete cases or controversies, a limitation that focuses our attention on the past, and a limitation to suggesting that the parties generally determine the scope of the dispute and in that way constrain the rule of decision that can emerge. I'd like to suggest to you that the founders would have included none of these features if they thought legislators free to judge and judges free to legislate. Why would the founders go to such trouble to insist that legislation pass through the arduous process of bicameralism and presentment only to entrust judges to perform the same function without similar safeguards? Who would devise a system that allowed unrepresentative litigants to define the debate over new legislation based on their narrow self-interest? And if the job of the judge were to legislate, why would we accept precedent as among the primary tools of the trade rather than empirical data or principle? or depend on the independent judgment of a single decision maker or maybe a handful, aided only by the latest crop of evanescent law clerks rather than on a larger body with more collective experience and ex expertise. In response to objections like these, Judge Posner's reply that, quote, American appellate courts are councils of wise elders and it's not completely insane to entrust them with responsibility for deciding cases in a way that will produce the best results for society. But respectfully, even that's not exactly a ringing endorsement of judges as social utility optimizers, is it? I can think of a lot of things that aren't completely insane, but distinctly ill-advised, or so I try to convince my teenage daughters these days. And respectfully, too, wouldn't we have to be at least a little crazy to recognize the Constitution's separation of judicial and legislative power and the duty of judges to uphold it, but then implore judges as they ignore all that and pursue what they have divined to be the best policy outcome? And is it not crazy to worry that if judges consider themselves free to disregard the separation of powers, they might also soon find bothersome parts of the Constitution equally unworthy of their fidelity? This observation leads to a second. It seems to me that the separation of, between legislative and judicial functions isn't just a formality dictated by the Constitution. Neither is it just about ensuring that two institutions with basically identical powers are balanced against each other. To the founders, the two sorts of powers were by their nature distinct in kind, and their separation was among the most important liberty protecting devices of the constitutional design a right of the people essential to the preservation of all the other rights later enumerated in the Bill of Rights. Though much could be said on this subject, tonight permit me to just touch on a few reasons why defending the legislative judicial divide is critical to preserving our bedrock guarantees of due process and equal protection. Consider if we allowed the legislator to judge first. If legislators were free to act as judges and create backward looking rules, they would be free to punish individuals for completed conduct they're unable to alter, raising along the way serious due process concerns. How can a citizen have fair notice of law and order her conduct around it if a lawmaker can go back in time and outlaw what was once reasonably thought lawful? And how might the average citizen ever hope to intervene in a legislative process of that sort to protect, prevent that prospect? With due process concerns like these come equal protection concerns too. If legislators could routinely act retroactively, what would happen to disfavored groups and individuals? With their past actions known and unalterable, they'd be easy targets for discrimination. No doubt worries exactly like these are why the founders prescribed bills of attainder and ex post facto laws criminalizing completed conduct and why there is baked into the legislative power a presumption as old as the common law itself that legislation should bear only prospective effect. 
Now consider the converse situation if we allow judges to legislate. Unconstrained by bicameralism presentment mandates of Article 1 that deliberately seek to make legislation difficult and ensure it's the product of compromise, a judge needs only his or her own vote or maybe those of a few colleagues to decide a case. So the task of legislating would become a very easy thing rather than a difficult one. And doing so retroactively, what would happen to fair notice? Could parties really hope to conform their conduct to the law's demands in advance? Or that would they be left to the mercy instead of whatever retroactively applied rule might be preferred by whatever future judicial legislator they happen across? And then again, there's the question of equal protection. What might the temptation be for the judge to use his newfound legislative authority to help favored parties and hurt disfavored ones? And notice too how hard it would be to revise this judicial legislation. Unable to throw judges out of office in regular elections, so you'd have to wait for them to die before you'd have any chance of correcting their mistakes. And even then you'd find it difficult for courts, unlike legislatures, cannot easily undo their errors given the weight they afford precedent. As Hamilton explained, liberty has nothing to fear from the judiciary alone, but it has everything to fear from the union of the legislative and the judicial powers. Blackstone painted an even grimmer picture, offering his view that in a regime where judges were free to legislate, quote, men would become slaves to their magistrates. Now, in case you think the founders' belief in the liberty protecting qualities of the separation of the legislative and judicial functions is pretty antiquated and maybe too ancient to be taken seriously, some of you students in the room, let me share with you a little story about a man by the name of Alfonso Denise Robles. Mr. Denise Robles is a Mexican citizen, married to a U.S. citizen, and the father of four U.S. citizen children. In 1999, he was found in the U.S. illegally, apprehended by authorities, and agreed to depart. For two years, he and his wife tried without luck to secure him a spousal visa. Denied the visa, he decided to return to the United States in 2001 with the hope of applying for lawful residency. But two competing statutory provisions confused his path. One appeared to require him to stay out the country, outside the country for at least a decade before applying for admission because of his earlier unlawful entry. Another, however, seemed to suggest that the Attorney General could overlook this past transgression and adjust his residency status immediately without demanding a departure. In 2005, my colleagues took up the question how to reconcile these two apparently competing directions as a reasonable person reading them might. In the end, the Tenth Circuit held that the latter provision controlled and the Attorney General's discretion to adjust authority remained intact. Relying on that favorable judicial determination of the law as it was, Mr. Denise Robles soon filed his application seeking relief. But then a curious thing happened. After spending some six years mulling over Mr. Denise Robles' petition, the Board of Immigration Appeals finally issued a decision in 2011 that purported to overrule our 2005 decision. The BIA said that the statutory scheme was ambiguous, that under Chevron step two it enjoyed the right to exercise its own delegated legislative judgment, that as a matter of policy it preferred a different approach, and that it could enforce its new approach retroactively to petitioners like Mr. Denise Robles. So that quite literally, get this, an executive agency acting in a faux judicial proceeding and exercising delegated legislative authority purported to overrule an existing judicial declaration of the law as it is and apply a new legislative rule retroactively to already completed conduct. Just describing what happened is enough to make James Madison's head spin. And what did the mixing of all this separated power, supposedly separated power, mean for due process and equal protection values? Back in 2005, Mr. Denise Robles thought the law gave him a choice. Begin a 10-year waiting period outside the country or apply immediately. In reliance on a judicial declaration of the law as it was, he chose the latter option as everyone in this room would. Now, in 2011, after years of waiting, the agency literally pulled a legal rug right out from underneath him, telling him, in essence, that he'd have to start that decade-long waiting clock now, 
even though if he had originally known that was his only option, his wait would be almost over. So it is that a man needs a time machine. After relying on a judicial declaration of what the law is, an agency in an adjudicatory proceeding seeks to make a legislative policy decision with retroactive effect in full view of the winners and losers, able to single out disfavored persons or classes and penalize them for conduct they cannot now alter, denying them in the process any chance to conform their conduct to a legal rule knowable in advance and implicating all of those concerns that the founders had in mind. What does this story suggest? The combining what are supposed to be, by design, separated legislative and judicial powers, we find ourselves with a grave threat to values of personal liberty, fair notice, and equal protection. But the problem isn't just one of King George's time, but one that persists even today during the reign of King James. Le LeBron, that is. <laughs> now, at this point, I can imagine the critic replying this way. Sure, judges should look to traditional tools of text, structure, and history, and precedent, all that. But in some hard cases, those materials will prove indeterminate. Some tiebreaker is needed, and that's where the judge's personal political convictions or consequentialist calculus or whatever else must come into play. Respectfully, though, I would suggest to you that the critic's conclusion does not follow from the premise. If anything, replies along these lines seem to me to wind up supplying a third and independent reason for, for embracing the traditional view about judging because it compares favorably to the alternatives. Now, I do not mean to suggest here that traditional legal tools always yield a single definitive right answer. Of course, Ronald Dworkin famously thought otherwise, contending that a Herculean judge could always land on the right answer. But at least in my experience, most of us judges don't much resemble Hercules. There's a reason why we wear loose-fitting robes. And I accept the possibility that in some hard cases, there's just simply not a right answer obviously at hand. At the same time, though, I'd like to suggest to you that the amount of indeterminacy in the law is wildly exaggerated. You law students out there are fed a steady diet of hard cases and over-large and over-costly case books stuffed with the most vexing cases ever issued. Hard cases as well are the daily bread of my friends, the law professors, and a source of riches for the more perfumed advocates in our profession. But I wonder, does anyone ever tell you along the way that only about 5% of all federal cases make it to a decision in an appellate court? Or that even among that small sliver, over 95% are resolved unanimously by the Court of Appeals? Or that even when it comes to the very hardest cases that remain, the cases where circuit judges disagree with one another and the Supreme Court grants cert, all nine judges on that court are able to resolve those cases unanimously 40% of the time. The fact is, over 360,000 cases are filed every year in our federal courts. In the Supreme Court, even but a single justice voices disagreement in only about 50 cases a year. That's, by the calculation of my law clerks, 0.014% of all cases. Focusing on the hard cases sure is fun, but doesn't miss the forest for the trees. And doesn't it also risk missing the reason why there's such a remarkable percentage of cases are determined by existing legal rules? The truth is that the traditional tools of legal analysis do an amazing job of resolving indeterminacy. Yes, lawyers and judges may sometimes disagree about which canons of construction are the most helpful in the art of ascertaining Congress's meaning in a complicated statute. We sometimes disagree over the order of priority we would assign to those competing canons. And we may even disagree over the results they yield in particular cases. But when judges pull from the same toolbox and look to the same materials to answer the same narrow question, what a reasonable person would have thought the law was at the time, we combine the range of possible outcomes and provide a remarkably stable and predictable set of rules that people are able to follow. And even when a hard case does arise, once it's decided, it takes on the force of precedent and that way becomes an easy case in the future, contributing further to the stability of our law. Truly, the system's a wonder when you think about it that way. 
And it's no wonder to me that it's the envy of so many throughout the world. Besides, okay, it seems to me that even accepting that some hard cases remain, yes, that 0.014%, it just doesn't follow that we must or should resort to our own political convictions, consequentialist calculi, or any other extra legal rule of decision to resolve them. Just as Justices Sotomayor and Kagan did in Lockhart, we can make our choice based on a comparative assessment of the various legal clues at hand, choosing whether the rule of the last antecedent or one of its exceptions fits the best the case in front of us in light of this particular language and statutory structure. At the end of the day, we may not be able to claim confidence that we've got a single definitive right platonic answer, but there's no reason why we can't make a judgment depending on and only on the conventional legal materials, a sort of closed evidentiary record, if you will, without peeking to the outside. No reason too why we cannot conclude for ourselves that one side has the better of it, even if by a nose, and even if while admitting that a disagreeing colleague could well see it the other way. As Justice Scalia once explained, quote, every canon is simply one indication of meaning. And if there are more contrary indications, perhaps supported by other canons, it must yield. But that does not render the enterprise a fraud, not at least unless the judge wishes to make it so. Neither do I see the critics as offering a better alternative. Consider, consider the story that Justice Scalia used to tell, loved to tell this one. Imagine two men walking in the woods. They happen across an angry bear. They start running for their lives quite naturally, but the bear is gaining on them quickly. One yells to the other, we'll never be able to outrun the bear. The other is perfectly calm and replies, I don't have to outrun the bear, I just have to outrun you. <laughs> As Justice Scalia explained, just because the traditional view of judging may be imperfect for some small set of cases, that doesn't mean we should abandon it. The real question is whether the critics can offer something better. And about that, I have my doubts. Take the model of the judge as the pragmatic social welfare maximizer. In that model, judges are supposed to weigh all the worldly costs and benefits of the various possible outcomes and pick the one best calculated to maximize our welfare. But in hard cases, don't both sides usually have a pretty good story about how deciding in their favor would advance the social good? In criminal cases, for example, we always hear from the government about how its view would promote security and finality. Meanwhile, the defense tells us about how its view would promote personal liberty and procedural fairness. How on earth is a judge supposed to weigh or rank these radically different incommensurable social goods? The fact is that the pragmatic model of judging offers us no value, no rule for determining which costs and benefits are to be preferred. It's sort of like asking judges to decide which is better, the departure of Johnny Manziel or the arrival of Hugh Jackson. My opinion, at least, both seem pretty good things for Cleveland. But at the end of the day, it seems to me we've also only traded one sort of indeterminacy problem for another. And the new indeterminacy problem invited by the critics may be a good deal more problematic given the challenges of trying to square their new models of judging with our constitutional design and with its underlying values. It seems to me that before we throw out the traditional view about judges and legislators and call it a, a day, we might do well to remember the bear. With those three points I briefly sketched for you tonight, I hope I've given you some sense why I believe Justice Scalia's vision of the good and faithful judge, as he called it, is a worthy one. But so far I've discussed pretty much academic principle and not plain unvarnished experience. And I run the risk of an objection for those who might suggest there's more between heaven and earth than is dreamt of in my philosophy. So as I close, I want to offer uh, a view of, about experience and, and suggest to you that the traditional view of judging and the law makes not just most sense to me intellectually, but it makes most sense of my life in the trenches of the law. My life in our shared profession has taught me that the law does bear its own language, its own structure, its own coherence, and its own integrity. When I was a lawyer and my young daughter asked me what lawyers do, the best I could ever come up with was to say that we help people solve their problems. As simple as it is, I still think that's the right answer. 
Lawyers take on their clients' problems as their own. We worry over them. We lose sleep over them. We struggle to solve them. We do so with a respect for and in light of the law as it is, seeking to make judgments about the future based on a reasonably stable set of existing rules. That's not politics. That's not legislating. That's the ancient and honorable practice of the law. Now as a judge, I see too that donning a black robe means something and not just that I can hide finally the coffee stains on my shirt. We wear robes, not business suits, and honest black polyester robes from the choir store at that, and you have to buy your own. <laughs> That's a democracy. That's the way it should be. We wear those robes as a reminder of what's expected of us when we go about our business, what Burke called the cold neutrality of an impartial judge. In my decade now on the bench, I've served with judges who strive daily to leave aside their personal biases and to be fair arbiters of the disputes placed in their hands. Men and women who do not thrust themselves into the limelight or expect to be much remembered, but who patiently tend to the great promise of the Constitution that all litigants will receive equal protection under the law and due process for their grievances. Judges who assiduously seek to avoid the temptation to secure the results they prefer, and who do in fact regularly issue judgments with which they disagree with vehemently as a matter of policy, all because they think that's what the law fairly demands. In the end, I'd like to suggest to you that Justice Scalia's legacy on this score is a most worthy one. One every person in this room has now inherited, and one you students will be asked to carry on soon enough. I remember as if it were yesterday sitting in a law school audience very much like this one, listening to a newly minted Justice Scalia offer the Oliver Wendell Holmes lecture titled The Rule of Law as a Law of Rules. He offered that salvo in the defense of the traditional view of judging almost 30 years ago now. Seems like it were yesterday. Comes so quickly. But it was, and I think it remains, a most worthy way to spend a life. May he rest in peace. Thank you. We have some time for questions. Um, I think there is a microphone. Is there a microphone? There's a microphone. I will. Um, I will quickly take the moderator's prerogative, though, of asking um, asking the first question. Of course. Um, uh, Judge, your team, in your remarks, one of the concerns you raised is Check one, the concern two. that uh, judges, if they go beyond traditional sources of judicial inter interpretation or, or judicial analysis, risk usurping the role of legislators. Uh, and you also told a story involving what's at stake in the context of executive agencies. And it seems today, much of our discussion is not so much the threat of the usurpation of legislative authority by the judicial branch, but the usurpation of legislative authority by the executive branch. And obviously you can't comment on any current specific issues, but I'm wondering if you have thoughts on what the role of the judiciary is or should be in policing that conflict. Uh, Justice Scalia certainly was a, a, a proponent of when in doubt, let the executive branch uh, uh, make those choices and lest judges usurp policymaking from uh, from the executive branch, but his critics would sometimes argue that that creates the other problem where the legislature's unfaithful delegation of, of such authority to the executive branch is, is left unchecked. And I just was curious if you had any thoughts about what, how a judge should approach that potential risk, the risk not of the judiciary usurping the policymaking role, but the judiciary allowing the policymaking role or the legislative role being usurped by another part of the government. Jonathan, that's the very next speech. Okay. So you got to pay. <laughs> um, no, seriously, uh, let me tell you a little story. Uh, I, I understand exactly what you're saying, and I agree with it, basically. Uh, I understand the gist of the speech. So there's a great statute. It's, it's called SORNA, Sex Offender Registry and Notification Act. And we all know it. And it's a very detailed and reticulated scheme uh, for future offenders. What do you do about all the people who've already been found to be sexual offenders under state law in the past? Congress passed maybe 22 pages with respect to future offenders and one sentence with respect to past offenders. And it said the following, more or less, 
I'm paraphrasing. Madam Attorney General, go figure it out. Uh, it's one sentence. I mean, it, it's not much more than this. I understand any delegation doctrine has uh, uh, been dormant for a very, very long time. But it seems to me it has to have some purchase for the very reasons I've articulated here that are equally applicable, I think, to the context you're talking about, Jeff. When the executive's acting as legislator, if you will. Uh, and uh, I wrote a very long dissent from denial of rehearing on Bonk on this question and said, you know, uh, if Schechter Poultry, um, which allowed uh, the executive to make a, a competition law for the poultry business, Mr. Attorney General, go write an antitrust law for the poultry business, is a problem. And it was 9 0 in that case. Then, Mr. Attorney General, go write a criminal law for half a million people is probably a problem too. Uh, so I, I, I don't shirk from the consequences of what I've suggested. Uh, in response to your question, uh, and um, I would suggest that there is room for uh, some hope with respect to the delegation of, of legislative authority to the executive when it comes to criminal law. Uh, Justice O'Connor uh, wrote as you know, that perhaps in those cases, in Tubi, uh, in criminal law cases, we should be more cautious about delegation of legislative authority to the executive. And for all the same reasons I've articulated, due process and equal protection concerns, the ability to retroactively legislate with full view of, of who's going to be hurt and who's going to be harmed, um, not behind a veil of ignorance, but with, with, with full view of winners and losers. So long-winded answer. Yes, is the answer. <laughs> now, now we have our microphones. So uh, if you'd like to ask a question, please, please raise a hand and, and wait for a microphone to come around. Um, there's one here, and I think there's one right up there. Of course, uh, Justice Scalia's career ended as a judge and in death, but that's because of the lifetime appointment of federal judges. But in the 1950s, uh, it was decided that uh, our biggest federal office holder, the president, should serve only 10 years at maximum. Do you think that maybe our law would be benefited if we restricted federal judges to 10 years and they could take their talents to the legislature or to private practice and then take the perspectives that you have and maybe uh, assist private practice or the legislators um, in dealing with these things called laws? I think I'm probably the last person to ask. <laughs> now, let me tell you, tell you a story why. I asked that very question of my old boss, Justice White, as he retired. And he said, hell yeah. And he, that's how he put Hell yeah. 14 years, no more. That's plenty. You've seen it all by then. That was Justice White's view. He had served 31 years on the Supreme Court at that stage. So I'm not sure judges are the right people to ask uh, that question. I do think. Um, you, you, you have some countervailing concerns. Um, if judges are doing what they're supposed to do, stick to their knitting, um, uh, they're not looking uh, uh, forward to their next career and who they might curry favor with. And I think that's an important thing. As a lawyer, uh, I just wanted a straight shooter. I, I didn't care. What, I just wanted someone who I knew was going to give me a straight shot. And I would be worried a little bit about that as a practitioner if I thought the judge might be coming knocking at my door in five years. I don't know. Yeah, um, I'm not sure I followed this, the immigration story, all the way to the end. I, I, Sorry. And, and maybe I missed something, but we, we got the story up to 2011 with the Bureau of Immigration Appeals saying, well, we disagree with what your court did. We're entitled to Chevron deference. Um, what happened from there? Oh, we, 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 you got to go read the opinion. Um, <laughs> what do you think I did? <laughs> I, suspect, I suspect that you did not accord Chevron deference to him, but, uh, well, uh, I, I, but I understand that as an appellate judge, you might have felt constrained to accord uh, we, Chevron we, we deference. Accorded Chevron deference said the statute is ambiguous, their interpretation is reasonable, but they can't apply it retroactively. But that is a violation of the separation of powers principles that I spoke about tonight. That was the opinion of our court. Unanimous, not a hard case. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Question here. Well, 
that was my same question. That is my question. Yeah. Why did they, uh, so, so. Were they just trying to push their weight around? No, this is no, 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 no. no. This is how administrative agencies routinely act. Doesn't the NLRB every day write new rules? I'm just picking on one agency, but they do it through an adjudicative setting that apply retroactively with relatively no, little notice to vast classes of people. Doesn't that raise some due process and equal protection? I'm, I'm, ask yourself. Additional question. Thanks. Interesting things happen when you allow the executive to exercise legislative authority in a judicial proceeding. That would be my respectful suggestion. You, you mentioned uh, Byron White and you uh, <clears throat> adopted a kind of a gruff voice. And I, um, I was before him once and that was my experience, but I, but I, I liked and respected him. <laughs> I'm sorry him. about that. No, 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 I liked and respected him, but I thought he was trying to you know, give me a hard time a little bit. And, uh, but uh, that's just your province uh, uh, being, being a judge. Well, tell us about uh, Byron. Did you play basketball with him up on the uh, sure. Supreme sure. Court court? Oh, yeah. uh, to, no, tell us about his, what you learned from him, uh, what you took away uh, from him in terms of judicial philosophy. Well, when he was tough on a lawyer, you knew it was coming. Because he'd start tapping his pencil. And he could hear on the microphone and get faster. And go, oh, hell. <laughs> the lawyers didn't know what that meant, but we knew what it meant. And then if things didn't go well, and sometimes they didn't, he'd actually spin his chair around. And that was it. You were done. Uh, <laughs> what did I learn from Byron White? I, I, had, I learned so He was probably the smartest lawyer I've ever met. Uh, you young folks may not remember or know this. He was the highest paid football player in the NFL of his day. His last record, collegiate record, was finally broken in 1988. I think by Deion Sanders, right? I think that's right. Is that right? I think that's right. It was all purpose yards. It was the one that the Stanford kid just broke uh, lately. And if you looked on the list during the, the bowl game, White's name was number three on the list now in 2016. He played almost, you know, 80 years ago now, right? He was also a Rhodes Scholar. First in his class at the University of Colorado while he was playing football in the Rose Bowl. Uh, a naval intelligence officer in the South Pacific, highly decorated. He had pictures of kamikaze pilots coming in to the carrier he was on that he took from the deck. And the last one, a series of them, and in his office, a series of them, the last one you could see the face of the kamikaze pilot. Justice, what the heck were you thinking about taking pictures? He said, if they're going to hit us, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Practiced law and then served as a justice for 31 years. Uh, what I learned from him was the care he took to get it right. Sweating details, sweating footnotes late at night. Sweating footnotes late at night with some crummy clerk who didn't know anything. And he loved competition, whether it was in, in law or on the basketball court. Uh, we would start drafting opinions and say, yeah, you write yours, I'll write mine. First one done wins. <laughs> what the heck does that mean? <laughs> so you're banging away and he's banging away and you stay late and he stays late and you try say, well, I'm not gonna let him leave without me, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be the first. He always won. And whoever's draft uh, lost, the loser's draft got thrown in the trash can. That was it, it was just gone. Now you try and sneak some of that in, ah, that's cheap. So you gotta work off the draft that's the winner. And, and that, was, that was just for fun. <laughs> Even, even in his late 70s, he could still play a mean game of horse. Uh, and he had a hell of a three-point shot from over the back like this. And he, he, he could hit it from about halfway between the free throw line and, and midcourt, 78 years old, uh, two out of three times. So what, you can, I could talk about Justice White all night. Thanks. Sorry. Additional questions?
I have, I have one other question for you. You mentioned in the beginning that if a, if a judge is doing their job right, that they will like, encounter in, instances in which the outcome they feel they have to reach is not one they like. And I was wondering to make sure, is there, is, is there a particular case that comes to mind where you felt the law was clear, but it, it was a good example of something that you would have wanted to reconsider had you been a legislator rather than a judge? I, I probably work on about 2,000 cases a year, Jonathan. I'd say in a good 1,900 of them, you could go look and that's probably the case. Um, th th there are a lot of really um, atrocious laws out there. Laws that, you know, none of, nobody likes. I mean, does anyone like the IRS? <laughs> but they always win. They always win. No, I'm, I'm, I'm joking. Uh, but I would say uh, it's just so numerous, I, I, I could give you 10. It's not one I could give you. I could give you off the head of some, I'll, I'll give you a list afterwards if you like, okay? Um, regularly, routinely. Um, not, not least of all, because very often uh, a good argument wasn't made, right? That's a very common one, right? How often does that happen? Where you know that the plaintiff had a winning case, for example, but lost it because of the non-feasance of, of counsel in, in the trial court. That happens and it breaks your heart every day. But we do it. But we do it. Because that's what the law requires. Well, please join me in thanking uh, Judge Fisher. We have, we have some small tokens of, oh, uh, of appreciation, um, so please uh, remember us by. Uh, thank you again all for coming. There is a reception on the other side of this wall, so if you go out either door, feel like a, 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 a flight attendant, go out either door and go around to the back. The, there are refreshments right behind the wall. Thank you.